I just want to add on something about this sunyata term because it's, it's a real problematic term, particularly in the West. Um, one of the things about Vedic philosophies is its obsession with logic and numbers. So sunyata comes from the uh, Sanskrit term sunya, which basically means zero. But that zero is not a zero of emptiness, as in a, a vacuum, as some people think, or a complete uh, motionless form of said. Sunyata actually has the potential to become either positive or negative, and that's the real key to it. So when you hear this term, be very wary of it, because a lot of people have got to get all sorts of very odd ideas of, of a kind of an annihilationist tendency. Anyway, enough of that. Okay. Materialism seems to start with a presumption or attempt of a direct knowing of a material world. This knowing suggests an I, a subject, and then an object, or other, and a variable distance between the I and the other. The self is critical to understanding old and new materialisms. The self in the form of the modern subject, empirical, scientific, and positivist. A self driven to know, a subject that gazes and wants. Buddhism invites a rigorous questioning of this self, a careful destabilization of the individual. The relationship between subject and object is one of the key investigations of Buddhist thinking, particularly in the Mahayana tradition. To quote the second Zen patriarch, uh, patriarch in Japanese, Sosan, things are objects because of the subject. The mind is such because of these things. Understanding the relativity of these two and the basic reality, the unity of emptiness. In this emptiness, the two are indistinguishable and each contains in itself the whole world. I'm interested in this questioning and the working with Buddhist texts to respond to the ideas of materialism and new materialisms. Today I want to do this with three stories or maybe scenarios around themes and qualities that are developed in Buddhism. Firstly, the idea of letting go, not being attached or clinging to things, clinging to objects. Secondly, to the idea of a complete letting go of body and of self in the form of the contentious act of self-sacrifice. And then finally, looking at the more approachable act, that of giving, of generosity, or in the Sanskrit and Pali, of dana, where boundaries of self and other start to be broken down with the sharing at various levels that start to take place. The Enlightenment worldview is a thirst for scientific, the Enlightenment worldview as a thirst for scientific knowing has been clearly useful and has answered many problems that we face. What this worldview doesn't seem useful for is the understanding of how we might interpret what we know, especially of the human condition, the fathomless depths of our heart and mind, and what we can think of as our conditioning, karma. The practice and process of Buddhism is to remove suffering by understanding the nature of our heart and mind, citta. To understand is to enter a process of gradually letting go to all things as we think as we think we see and understand them. To quote from the Bahiya Sutta of the Odana, an original Buddhist text, in reference to the seen, there is only the seen. In reference to the heard, only the heard. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In re reference to the cognized, only the cognized. One simply looks and delights, not wanting to grasp and control what you see, and also not avoiding what you don't want to see. This is the act of looking that I can think can be experienced in the work of Wolfgang Leib. But there is a call to, go, call to go further, to a process to reduce and ultimately remove this suffering. The subject-object relationship must be radically challenged in this process. This letting go, this involves a letting go that is radical in contemporary consumer and materialist society. The first story, letting go of things. This is Jason. Jason is known as the walking monk. 
He was born Jason Chan in Sydney and at the age of 29 was ordained as a Buddhist monk. When you ordain as a Buddhist monk, as a renunciant, you are given a Buddhist name. It's the identity you have when you're trying not to have an identity. The Buddhist name he was given was Jinasiri, the Venerable Jinasiri, as he's called, meaning roughly the Great Conqueror, Conqueror of Delusion. He actually uh, prefers to use his birth name. He was created as a character on the web, as the walking monk, and has been virtually tracked in recent times as he slowly walked all the way down from Townsville, North Queensland, to Sydney. This is actually something he's not keen on. In his wanderings, he declines offers of transport, any assistance except for the offers of food and water. The food he is offered is always eaten before noon. He didn't actually walk all the way from Townsville to Sydney in truth. For about 500 metres in central Queensland, there were roadworks. This made it impassable and precluded him from walking in that particular stretch. A road worker offered him a lift for that small distance and he accepted. He lives on the road, sleeping under bridges and trees. He washes in streams and waterholes. He carries only his inner and outer robe, as prescribed under the traditional Buddhist monks and nuns rules of Vinaya, and a small blanket, as you can see. He also carries a food bowl to collect offerings from the community. He doesn't wear shoes or socks, even in Sydney winter. His is an attempt to live as simply as possible, as a precursor to a grating, greater letting go. He wants to rid himself of possessions and any extraneous behaviours that dilute his ability to concentrate on what he sees as important, questioning the self. He insists on a homeless life. He resists settling in any institutional setting. In his view, this is both against the Buddha's teaching and also has the potential source of corruption that institutionalisation brings. He resists being photographed or recorded as he wants to experience people directly and vice versa. He happily talks with people as he moves around the country. He gives talks about life and his experience of it. He tries to focus any discussion on what he really sees as important in both his and their lives. Each morning he puts on his outer robe and walks into the centre of a town or a suburb and waits on the street with, with his bowl. People often come up and talk to him. Some understand that he needs to be given food to survive and accordingly offer him food. Some people especially buy him food in the supermarket as they enter and shop and bring it out to him as he waits out front. He only eats what he has been given. He does not buy anything as he carries no money. He really does rely on the kindness of strangers. He gets offered a lot of fruit and often chocolates and other sweets. He often has to unload excess food to those who he encounters who are in need, as he gets offered too much sometimes, or sometimes just too many sweets. He also goes hungry some days, as the offerings can be very small. Some days he will only get fruit. One Sunday I asked if I could follow him at a distance and watch and take photographs. I said that I would keep a considerable distance away and would stop if I sensed that I was affecting his capacity to be offered food, perhaps the idea that the observer affects what is being observed. He agreed to this. Jason's image is also recorded as a drawing and it appears as one of the figures in my work in the gallery today. His is a movement away from the senses of things as possessions or things of attraction or repulsion. Things as they are are not to be grasped after or conversely thrust away. They are to be enjoyed just as they are. It is to be done so as to bring freedom and happiness. The second scenario, the, unfathomable, the unfathomableness of self-sacrifice. In 2012, various reports in the Western media, but mostly online, suggest that at least 95 ethnic Tibetans had self-immolated. They had attempted to set themselves on fire by dousing themselves in some flammable, likely petrol, and then sticking a match or a lighter to it, causing themselves to burn. That 95 was a general figure of known and reported cases as cited by Kovan in 2013. There may be many, many more of these acts attempted, but how many we don't really know, as the Chinese state tried and still tries very hard to stop these incidents and to control any of these images getting out to the media. 
Most of the cases that make up this tally occur in southwestern provinces, largely in Tibetan Buddhist communities. The term self-immolation means self-sacrifice from the Latin immolare, an offering. What we see happening in Sichuan province and elsewhere can be described in a material sense as auto-cremation, a term used by Ben 2007 in his book, Burning for the Buddha. It seems in these acts mostly as a protest. The extent of these self-immolations and auto-cremations and very loosely similar acts by the Uyghur and Falun Dafa people have led to these very interesting images from Tiananmen Square in Beijing. As both an artist and as a Buddhist, these events hold a multifaceted interest. Most importantly, they are so gut-wrenchingly confrontational, visceral, shocking. That shock starts to plumb and shock the depths of my heart, mind, my chitta. It is an extreme act, one of the most extreme acts that a person can perform. A suffering that is unimaginable and unbearable. Around the same time, around the beginning of 2012, with the start of the Arab Spring and the protest auto-cremation of Mohammed Bosasi. In his case, the reason was an act of protest against the dictatorship of Ben Ali in Tunisia. And here is the dictator Ben Ali visiting Bosasi in hospital, watching him as he dies, refusing him, to, refusing him being flown to France for any kind of treatment. My research is partly involved in the considerations of such act. They have a very long and complicated history in Vedic cultures. They are tied to various cases, in various cases, to spiritual attainment, but this varies. The historical Buddha used powerful visual metaphors on the conditions of our lives, metaphorically speaking, being on fire with greed, hatred, and delusion. This is the basic malady we all face in the view of Buddhism, a standard teaching of Buddhism 101. Another core teaching is the middle path approach of steering away from the extreme acts of slow self-mortification on one hand, such as is practiced by Jains, and the other, an obsessive desire for worldly pleasures practiced by the so-called materialists. Early Buddhist texts also describe an incident where monks took their own lives in despair at the revulsion they experienced in their own bodies. This is not what the Buddha had intended, and he explicitly forbade suicide. Later Buddhist texts, however, have stories that champion the idea of self-immolation, where it is clearly seen to be of benefit for others. First in the Jataka tales, most likely developed about 100 years after the Buddha's death, is the story of King Mahasattva. One slide, two slide. The, uh, plus, the plaza in Paris named after Buzasi. Oops, there's a slide missing. Uh, ah, that's the one. Uh, sorry, they're out of order. Did get that? Okay. Uh, firstly, in the Jataka tales developed 100 years is the story of King Mahasattva responding to the plight of a starving tigress with cubs by offering his own blood firstly and then his own body to the animal so as to eat that she may be able to feed her cubs. And this is a Japanese scroll uh, from the 9th century um, showing the uh, stage descent of Mahasattva as he dives off a cliff after first sending blood down to the tigress and her cubs down to bottom. In the Lotus Sutra, another later text, another king sacrifices himself by soaking in oil and setting himself alight. He burns for countless eons, which is an hyperbolic term to suggest the extraordinary extent of his sacrifice and of the offering. These stories have had a profound effect on Eastern Buddhism, particularly Chinese Buddhism, and with special interest within the Pure Land sects. Ben of 2007 goes to extensive detail about so episodes of self-immolation by autocremation in Chinese culture, often condoned and even celebrated by the emperor of the day. These acts have now become the stuff of legend, and the image of an enlightened being self-sacrificing by autocremation even appears in a number of kung fu movies. This, I'm just going to go backwards. For this. There we go. this history leads very quickly to the image from 1963 from Saigon at the time of the escalation of the Vietnam War. These talismanic images of protest are of the venerable Tik Duc 
as recorded by Malcolm Brown, self-immolating and auto-cremating in one, District 1 of Saigon. It is one of those great images seared into the cultural memory of generations. It speaks to the necessity of out-of-control protest in the 60s against regimes out of control. Looking at a number of the other frames of this incident, both before and after the act, what fascinated me were the groups of monks and nuns that surrounded Tikwan Duk, and you can see particularly the grouping on the top right of nuns. Reading the accounts of Brown and others, you start to see that the Venerable Duk's act was not only witnessed by the community of monks and nuns, but the event was clearly constructed and supported by them. The monks and nuns had arranged for certain press to be there, certain others not, for the police and emergency uh, services not to be there, or at least to be delayed so the act could be consummated. They clearly endorsed the Venerable's actions by theirs. What was going on here, particularly from a Buddhist perspective? How, later on, could one of the leading Buddhist peace activists, the Venerable Thich, Quan, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, support and sometimes then equivocate, equivocate on this act, as well as His Holiness the Dalai Lama? The Dalai Lama now condemns such acts, particularly those in China. How then also did Gandhi support such acts? Arguments continue as to whether these acts are at all justified in terms of the balance between karma and generosity. The idea then that this is a purely political protest is only part of this long and detailed history. This would also downplay the idea of the performer being of a higher spiritual realization. The case is made where a person is able to abandon the body, having no attachment to it as a material, not struggling to preserving it, knowing that it'll eventually fall apart and decay. Not being attached to it, they see a higher good in performing such an act. King 2005 and Biggs 2008 also document a range of autocremation acts that seem outwardly to be copycat actions. It has also uh, been suggested that the extent of Tibetan self-immolation uh, currently is in large part a copycat effect in a situation uh, of the suppression of the Tibetan people. What then is an act that seeming, seemingly has some spiritual un underpinning? It is the most extreme act of sacrifice and questioning that is still very difficult to understand and also shocks one to the core of self. The third story. Since 1990, the Thai American and Buddhist artist Rikrit Tiravanajit has developed his art practice in the preparation and offering of food to people, often in a gallery setting. He cooks, and from what I've been told, he cooks really well. His grandmother was also a well-known cook in Bangkok. He mostly cooks Thai food, soups, pad thai, and curry, usually for large numbers of people. Rikrit also uh, cooks for people on the road as an artwork, using a bicycle-mounted kitchen setup where people meeting a lot, where people meet along the road, along his ride, and share a meal together with him cooking. Another slide of one of the cooking sessions. The Pali term for this, in, for this is intention, or dana, meaning generosity. In this case, by the making and offering of food. Sharing, breaking down the distinction of self and other by offering food from you to someone else. Breaking down barriers by sharing a meal with others. Sometimes, in Rickrit's case, with perfect strangers. They share a table, a soup and conversation without charge or any conditions. In these three scenarios are different perspectives on the path to bringing, to, self, uh, to bringing self and other together, sometimes in extreme ways. How do we question these, how do we question things that do us harm? Artists by making and offering art, one is, uh, this means practicing one of the trainings of Buddhism, generosity, one of these trainings to be practiced again and again. 